So we're going to look at the three forms of transport across the cell membrane. And so the first form that we've studied already is simple diffusion. And as we already know, simple diffusion enables us to, or enables molecules to move across the cell membrane from high to low concentration. There's also what is called facilitated diffusion. This is diffusion that's aided by one of those transport channel proteins. These are both forms of passive transport. Then there's what's called active transport in which energy is required to move the molecules against their concentration gradient. So basically trying to push your bike or pedal your bike uphill. Now that active transport also involves the use of a specialized protein in the cell membrane, um, but it does require the cell to expend energy. So let's learn about these different types of transport. So first of all, passive transport. This is, um, the, the first example is what we've already been looking at, and it's simple diffusion. It doesn't require any energy. It moves molecules from high to low concentration. An example would be oxygen moving across the membrane or water diffusing into the cell and carbon dioxide diffusing out. Passive transport, um, I'm sorry, another form of passive transport is facilitated diffusion. This still doesn't require any energy. It uses transport proteins to move from high to low concentration and examples include glucose or amino acids moving from the blood into a cell. Proteins are critical to membrane function. And so we can look at them because they provide structural support. They can perform recognition for us. They can communicate with other cells as well as transport. <coughs> so let's look at the different types of transport proteins. Channel proteins are those that are embedded in the cell membrane and have a pore for materials to cross. Carrier proteins can change shape to move material from one side of the membrane to the other. So with facilitated diffusion, these channel proteins provide a passageway for molecules too large to pass through the phospholipids to get into the cell. So these molecules will move totally randomly through the pores in the channel proteins. Now, another way facilitated diffusion can work is some carrier proteins don't actually go all the way through. They don't start on one side of the membrane facing outside the cell and make like a little pathway to the inside. Some of them physically move like the video that you're seeing here. So they bond and then drag molecules through the lipid bilayer and then release them on the opposite side. Carrier proteins work in exactly the same way in that they change shape. So they still extend through the cell membrane. Like part of the protein is facing the outside and part of it's facing inside, but it's almost like a one-way movement. And you can see in this diagram, we're moving those red particles from the inside of the cell to the outside of the cell. It's kind of like those turnstiles. If you've been to Menards, you walk in and you gotta go through that little, um, the, what's it called? It's called the turnstile, shoot. Um, if you've been on the subway, um, or the train down in Chicago. It's the same thing. You've got to pass through one of those, but you can only go in one direction. It doesn't work backwards. So our goal today is to look at active transport. And active transport is different than the forms of passive transport in that it requires ATP or energy. We also are moving materials from low to high concentration. Now, if you remember from the previous video, I talked about um, diffusion being a really easy movement of molecules from high to low concentration. Almost like you're sitting at the top of the hill on your bike, you can just pick your feet up and kind of glide down the hill and you don't have to put any energy into it. But with active transport, it's the exact opposite. It's like you're sitting down at the bottom of the hill at a low gradient, a low concentration, and you have to move uphill against the gradient to a higher concentration. So some examples of this in cells include the pumping of ions. 
So there's something that's called the sodium potassium pump. Okay? This is going to be pumping sodium ions out of the cell and potassium ions into the cell against a strong concentration gradient. Now, if we watch what's going on here, for every three sodium that's pumped in, I'm sorry, there are three sodium molecules pumped in for every two potassium pumped out. So you see how the two potassium get moved out and three sodium get pumped in. So as that special protein faces inwards, it's picking up the sodium, the red molecules, and that bonding causes a change in the protein structure. Then the three yellow molecules, the sodium, are able to bond, which then reverses the structure of that protein to face back to the inside. Kind of cool. Now, we also have to worry about moving some of the really big stuff. Okay? Exocytosis is moving things out. That prefix, exo, or exiting, means moving out of the cell. And so as molecules are moved out, they typically are in what's called a transport vesicle or vacuole, and that vesicle fuses with the cell membrane, and then the materials are exposed. This is how many hormones are secreted and how nerve cells actually communicate with one another. Then, whoop, can't really see all that, can you? Then um, we've got the large movement of materials into the cell through one of three forms of what we call endocytosis. Okay. <coughs> So I apologize, endocytosis, because it wasn't written on the previous slide, is the movement of materials into the cell. Now the first example is penocytosis. Okay? This is moving extracellular fluid to the inside of the cell. It's a very, very common form of endocytosis. And it takes in dissolved molecules as a vesicle. Penocytosis basically forms what's called an invagination into the cell membrane. And the materials um, dissolved in water can then be brought into the cell. It's typically referred to as cell drinking because it's taking in a liquid. Now, one way I remember this is I think of, and don't make fun of me, but I think of pina coladas. Penocytosis is just like taking in a liquid. So that's one way I remember it. Then, here we've got a picture of penocytosis. And so we can see these vesicles here forming on the surface of the cell membrane. Here's one that's about to pinch off, and here's some that are literally moving to the inside of the cell. So what you can see here is this is transport across a capillary cell. So part of one of your capillaries that transports um, uh, the blood close to the surface of the skin. So um, that capillary cell is what is in blue there. There's also what is called receptor-mediated endocytosis. And receptor-mediated endocytosis uses integral proteins that are built right into the surface of the cell membrane. And they've got receptors that recognize and then specifically take in that molecule. So when something moves in here, like a hormone, and binds to that surface protein, it tells the cell, I'm something that should be inside. And that causes the cell membrane to start to form a coated pit or an invagination. And then all of those molecules are taken inside that vesicle and transported into the cell. So that image that we looked at a little while ago was of receptor-mediated endocytosis. So we can see, here's how it starts, and here's everything on the surface. Here's, that, here's um, the invagination forming. Here's the cell membrane about to pinch apart. And then there's the vesicle 
on the inside. Now what this is actually showing, it's actually showing viruses um, entering inside one of the nasal cells. So here's another diagram depicting um, that receptor mediated endocytosis. Kind of interesting. And then there's what's called phagocytosis. If pinocytosis, like pina colada, is cell drinking, phagocytosis is like cell eating. It's used to engulf large particles like food, um, bacteria even, into those vesicles. So anything that's a solid, really. Um, and I remember this, not because of phagopop, because everybody tries to say that, but the pH sound of phagocytosis sounds just like the F sound in food. So phago means food. Um, so just, a, just one way to think of it. Um, pino is cell drinking, phago is cell eating. Totally fat, if you get it. Ha ha, Mrs. Learned, you're so funny. So here's an example um, of phagocytosis about to occur. This is a white blood cell um, on the surface of a red blood cell. These are some bacteria down here, and this white blood cell is extending out a pseudopod, and it's about to engulf that and take it in. So phagocytosis in this picture um, is showing a yeast cell in yellow and the membrane extensions of the immune cell or the white blood cell that's about to engulf it and take it in. Pretty cool image. Then there's what's called exocytosis. And if you would, um, exocytosis was up at the top of the page underneath the title moving the big stuff. Make sure you've got a definition down for exocytosis. Um, this is the movement of those large molecules that are manufactured in the cell that then have to be released through the cell membrane. So this is it. This is the end of this unit. Um, and so we're going to do some activities based upon some of these concepts, and then we'll be ready to test.